Good. Well, thank you very much for inviting me tonight, uh, and uh, thank you very much for your interest in, uh, in my book, which, as Kara said, is The Curse, Big Time Gambling's Seduction of a Small New England Town. Uh, the book is a novel set against the explosion of casino gambling in Connecticut during the 1990s when two Indian tribes built the world's two biggest casinos in the southeastern corner of our state. The, uh, the story is about Connecticut, but with the same underlying themes and issues, it's relevant to hundreds of communities across America, including, I think you'll find, to East Greenbush. The story, the book, the story of the book, begins with the Pequot War back in the 1600s, when the Connecticut colonists got together with their Mohegan allies and defeated and almost destroyed the Pequots, who were the largest and most warlike of the Connecticut Indian tribes. The story then jumps some 350 years as these two tribes reemerge almost miraculously, thanks to Congress and the courts, <laughs> to build these two enormous <coughs> enterprises, Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun. And in the book, a fictional Connecticut family becomes embroiled in a battle to stop a third casino that threatens the family's town and ancestral home. <coughs> so in the end, uh, a uh, the story is really a Faustian tale about a small, quintessential New England town faced with a dilemma, whether or not to accept an enormously lucrative and seductive offer that would change the town forever, or try to preserve its character and its values. The Curse in Sum is a novel based on fact. And this evening, I thought uh, what I'd do is discuss mainly the background to the book, and then uh, take your questions uh, uh, afterwards. I should probably start, though, by giving you just a little more of my own background, because it figured into my writing of the story. But I represented Eastern Connecticut in Congress during the 1970s, and then I left Congress to run for governor of Connecticut. I was unsuccessful. And at that point, I left politics, and my family, my wife, and our four children moved from Vernon, Connecticut, in the northeastern part of the state, down to Ledger, Connecticut, uh, well before the uh, casinos were even a glint in anyone's eye. And we lived there, literally on the edge of the Mashantucket Pequot Reservation, for the next 21 years. And those two experiences, knowing the political backdrop of Connecticut as intimately as I did, and then living in the midst of this casino gambling explosion, gave me a front row seat for watching all the political maneuverings that led to the casinos and then seeing their impact uh, firsthand. Now, Indian casinos, this is actually a good time to talk, start the talk by talking about Indian casinos because it's just about the 25th anniversary of something called the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act <coughs> that Congress passed back in 1988 in order to help poor, federally recognized Indian tribes <coughs> build casinos on their reservations in order to raise money to support their tribal governments. It would be fair to say, however, that Congress had absolutely no idea of the Pandora's box it was opening when it passed this law. Because as it turned out, the law not only opened the door to Indian casinos, but it spurred the legalization and the opening of non-Indian, commercially owned casinos across the United States as well. As state after state rushed in to invite casinos into their states in order to raise revenue without having to openly and overtly and honestly raise taxes. Back in 1988, <coughs> only two states allowed casinos. Nevada, obviously, with Las Vegas, and New Jersey with Atlantic City. Today, 40 states have legalized casinos, and America is now awash in casinos. We now have almost 1,000 of them 
just about equally divided between Indian and non-Indian commercially owned casinos. And as a result, casino gambling has literally become America's new national pastime. With more people in the United States going to casinos today than to professional baseball, football, basketball, hockey, soccer, and you can throw in any other professional sport you're aware of combined. That's how big and overwhelming it has become. Nowhere, though, in the last 25 years did it become casino gambling bigger, faster than in the state of Connecticut. Foxwoods opened back in 1992 in Ledger, and Mohegan Sun opened in 1996, seven and a half miles away in the town of Montville, Connecticut. They were the first casinos in the entire Northeast outside of Atlantic City, and with no other competition, they quickly grew to become the two biggest casinos on the planet, drawing over half their combined customers from out of state mainly New York, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, but from all over the Northeast, creating 20,000 casino jobs and beginning to send hundreds of millions of dollars a year to the state treasury in Hartford in shared slot revenue. It's truly one of the most amazing stories in the history of New England. These two tribes, the Mashantucket Pequots and the Mohegans, once mortal enemies trying to destroy each other, and then gradually, over the generations, re-emerging. <coughs> and all during that period, uh, 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 losing most of the Indian blood that originally made up the tribe, most of the Indian culture, until almost none of it was left, and then re-emerging, thanks to Congress and the courts to build these two enormous enterprises. Great story. Right. Except, of course, the story is not over. And with each passing year, we're learning more and more about the downside of what's happened in Connecticut. And believe me, it takes a while to learn what the consequences are. The casinos, first of all, in Connecticut have created a pervasive gambling culture in southeastern Connecticut. They've skewed our economy there sharply toward low-paying service jobs, which seem to be becoming more low-paying every single month. And they've resulted in a sharp spike in the number of Connecticut residents seeking treatment for gambling addiction. One of the most remarkable findings of a 2009 State of Connecticut study was that there had been a 400% increase in the number of arrests for embezzlement in Connecticut since the casinos opened a rate of increase 10 times the national average. Mm. One of the embezzlers, incidentally, was actually my tax collector. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, she stole $302,000 from tax receipts in order to play the slots at Foxwoods. I, oh, I never really knew whether my tax receipts, my tax checks were among them, but I always assumed they probably were. In any event, she didn't win. Obviously, she didn't win because nobody wins over time. It is statistically impossible when the casino takes 10% of everything you bet. Oh, sure, you can hit a jackpot, you can hit it big some night, but if you keep gambling, statistically, it's virtually impossible to win. The number of arrests for embezzlement in Connecticut, and especially southeastern Connecticut, since the casinos opened, has been so great that the New London Day, our largest newspaper in southeastern Connecticut, has described the region as the embezzlement capital of America. And these embezzlements, incidentally, aren't just every once in a while. Perhaps you read about the most recent one, big one, in Connecticut. You may have because it was a national story. And it took place not that far from here, actually, in the northwestern corner of Connecticut in the little town of Winchester, Connecticut, where the chief financial officer somehow, I still can't figure out exactly how he did it, somehow managed to steal over $2 million over a period of four and a half years from the town. And he lost most of it at the two casinos. It was an embezzlement so big that it brought the little town of Winchester literally to its knees, 
right up until Christmas time, it was talking about having to close the school system because the town had run out of money. Mm -hmm. Moreover, uh, according to a just released study by Professor Francis Muska of Western Connecticut State University, the increase in crime since the casinos opened has by, has by no means been limited to embezzlement. And this is what I mean about how long it takes to learn about what the real impact is on a community. This study just came out literally in the last four weeks. We've had these casinos now for 20 years. According to the study, the number of violent crimes, including murder, rape, robbery, and aggravated assault, has increased in the towns surrounding the casinos despite a sharp drop in violent crime nationally and in Connecticut as a whole, while the value of property crime in those towns has skyrocketed by nearly 40%. In addition, interviews uh, by the author with police and judicial officials indicated increases in crime such as nonviolent crimes such as prostitution and illicit drug use. As far back as 1997, Congress became so concerned about what it had done and this spread of casino gambling, uncontrolled spread of casino gambling across the country, that it set up a national commission to study the issue. Based on its findings, the commission recommended that there be a moratorium on the building of new casinos in the United States until the federal government could get a better handle on the social and economic costs. In addition, the commission recommended banning credit card and ATM use at casinos. If you happen to have been at a casino lately, we get a particular kick, I think, out of that recommendation. <laughs> they recommended, they recommended this, is a con this was a commission set up by the President of the United States and Congress. It recommended prohibiting aggressive casino advertising, such as you see on television all the time now and it recommended restricting political contributions by the gambling industry in order to guard against political corruption. <laughs> the recommendations, however, as I don't need to tell you, were never implemented. And the number of casinos has continued to multiply. In the process, casino gambling has become a $67 billion industry. That's just from gaming. That doesn't include hotels, and restaurants and, uh, and entertainment and all the other paraphernalia uh, that, uh, that, that goes with it. And the casino industry in the process has become one of the most powerful political groups in the United States. Again, something I need to tell you since you're living it and breathing it right now here in East Greenbush. The industry during this time uh, uh, has continued to make its way into state after state and town after town by arguing that it spurs economic development, creates jobs, and provides states and municipalities with much needed revenue. You may have heard that <laughs> Opponents, however, have long argued that casinos do far more harm than good. They begin with the facts that gambling, uh, gambling addiction, uh, 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 that gambling is addictive after all, for millions of people. That the casino's gambling profits come from the losses of other people. Yes. And that gambling addiction leads to debt, bankruptcies, broken families, and crime. Second, opponents reject the contention that casinos promote economic development. In Connecticut's case, they point out that casinos have done little or nothing to create spin-off businesses but instead have cannibalized existing businesses and left Connecticut residents with billions of dollars less to spend on other goods and services. One example of cannibalization, incidentally, actually involves a very good friend of mine, or he was a very good friend of mine. He owned one of the most successful restaurants in southeastern Connecticut, and I remember very well how excited he was the day Mohegan Sun opened about two miles up the road. And I remember him telling me that he thought for sure with all these people coming down from Boston and up from New York City and over from Albany and over from Providence, surely hundreds of these people every month would stop at his restaurant. Maybe to have lunch before they went to gamble or to have dinner on the way home. 
Or maybe some of these 20,000 employees at the end of their shift would look for some way to relax and go to his restaurant, maybe go to the bar and have a drink, or maybe have a bite to eat afterwards. It took 29 months for him to decide to close his restaurant. And I'll never forget what he told me at that time. He said, you know, Bob, he said, I cannot believe how naive I was about the way the casinos work. But now I understand. People drive to the casinos, they play at the casinos, they go to shows at the casinos, they stay at the casino hotels, they eat at the casino restaurants, and then they fill up their gas tanks at the casino gas stations and drive home. We, as local merchants, rarely, if ever, see any of these people. As casino mogul Steve Wynn once told a group of Connecticut small businessmen in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where he wanted to build a casino, he told them, get it straight. One of the things I love about Steve Wynn is how direct he is. And he told so a group like you, get this straight, he told them. There is no reason on earth for you to expect more for more than one second that just because people come to my casino, they're going to run into your store or restaurant. Third, opponents say there's little evidence that casinos ultimately strengthen a state's or a municipality's finances. Connecticut, they know, receives 25% of Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun's slot revenue, which has provided the state with more than six and one half billion dollars over the last 20 years. Yet today, Connecticut is in the worst financial shape in its history, with the lowest job growth and one of the highest debt and unfunded liability ratios of any state in the nation. <laughs> Something that you might want to mention to your governor. <laughs> and, now, and now, an independent group of scholars and public policy officials assembled by the Institute for American Values in New York City, one of the country's leading think tanks, has published a study that looks at the impact this, this uh, casino explosion has had on the country as a whole. And I thought you'd be interested in their findings. One, once an occasional and largely upper class activity, casino gambling has moved from the margins to the mainstream of American life. Two, today's regional casinos, like the one they want to build here in East Greenbush, Today's regional casinos are different from traditional Vegas-style casinos that catered predominantly to well-heeled players who came from long distances away and preferred table games. In contrast, new casinos are primarily slots barns, filled with a whole new generation of highly addictive slot machines and cater overwhelmingly to middle and low rollers who live within an hour away return frequently and play the slots. Three, modern slot machines have transformed American gambling. Slots are no longer the one-armed bandits that we tend to think of when we think about slot machines. In fact, if you've been to a casino lately, you know the new slot machines don't even have arms. They become instead sophisticated computers created by some of the best brains in America in order to keep people playing as long as possible, in order to lose as much money as possible over time. If you're interested in this subject, I suggest you read a book, uh, a new book, titled Addiction by Design, by a brilliant MIT professor by the name of Natasha Schull. And read, the book reads <coughs> like a, a mystery, but believe me, when you finish it, you will be out of breath to know what they want to bring into your community. Mm. Four, while casinos represent themselves as benign entertainment companies, they are in fact predatory businesses that depend on problem gamblers, that is people with some level of gambling addiction, for 40 to 60 percent of their profits. Five, living within 50 miles of a casino doubles the chance of developing a gambling addiction. Six, Casinos constitute a regressive tax that hits low wage earners, 
minorities, and the elderly the hardest, thereby contributing to economic inequality in America, where we heard that term before. Supposedly is something that both our political parties are very worried about. Seven, state sponsorship of gambling is a conflict of interest for state governments that are established to promote the general welfare not prey on thousands of their most vulnerable citizens by encouraging them to gamble. In sum, according to this study from the Institute for American Values, the long-term costs of the new regional and local casinos exceed their benefits by three to one. They drain wealth from communities, weaken nearby businesses, hurt property values, and reduce volunteerism, civic participation, family stability, and other forms of social capital that are at the heart of a successful community like East Greenbush. Now, despite the cost, the conventional wisdom in Connecticut has been that our casinos have been a net economic plus for the state of Connecticut in the past because of their success in attracting such a large number of out-of-state gamblers and customers who gamble and leave their money in Connecticut. But the regional monopoly that has allowed Connecticut's casinos to attract so many out-of-staters has now largely disappeared, as the Northeast has become increasingly saturated with casinos. When Foxwoods opened in 1992, there were only 10 other casinos in the 12 states of the Northeast, and all of them were in Atlantic City, 250 miles away. Today there are 53 casinos in those 12 states and the number could easily go to 70 based on those approved or under consideration. As a result of all the growing competition, particularly from Rhode Island's Twin River Casino uh, in, uh, uh, in Lincoln, Rhode Island, and the casinos at Aqueduct and Yonkers Racetracks, which are enormous slots casinos, as some of you I'm sure know. Thanks to them, Connecticut's slot revenue is already down 35% from its peak, with the state government's share falling from $430 million to less than $280 million a year today. Connecticut's casinos have now laid off several thousand employees and have been increasingly replacing full-time jobs with part-time jobs in order to lower overall wage costs and get rid of medical benefits. And Foxwoods uh, has stopped all profit-sharing payments to its tribal owners and defaulted on a half billion dollars worth of its loans. The same downward trend, I know I don't have to tell you this, but the same downward trend <coughs> is underway now in an increasing number of states because of the increasing competition and the financial squeeze on lower and moderate income people. Here in the Northeast, for example, Delaware's legislature, and you probably didn't even know Delaware has three casinos, it's one of the early states in the casino business. Delaware's legislature has now authorized, in just the last two years, $41 million to bail out its three casinos. Well, New Jersey has spent many, many times that trying to prop up its casinos. Atlantic City had 12 casinos at the beginning of this year. It is now down to eight casinos, and another one, the Taj Mahal, is likely to close in the next few weeks at a total cost of over 9,000 jobs. The assessed value of all property in Atlantic City has dropped by almost half, and the city enacted a 29% property tax hike for 2015. Jeez. That's what begins to happen on the way down. Mm. Back in Connecticut, Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun say, look, they have no intention of sitting back and watching all this new competition eat their lunch. What they say they plan to do is to uh, upgrade their facilities and to begin to add new attractions in order to try to keep attracting as many people from out of state as possible. But it's very unlikely that many out-of-staters will continue traveling all the way to eastern Connecticut in order to gamble when they have a brand new casino in their own backyard. Instead, Connecticut's casinos will have to increasingly turn inward 
and depend on attracting more and more Connecticut people to gamble in order to stay solvent, which means more and more social and economic problems for Connecticut. Now, at this point, one might think that Connecticut would recognize the short-sightedness of depending <coughs> on, uh, uh, let alone uh, promoting, gambling as a revenue source and begin to make a serious effort to control spending and develop more stable sources of revenue. <coughs> but that, of course, is not, as happened, is not what has happened. That's too simple to think <laughs> that's what would happen. Instead, many of our political leaders in Connecticut appeared determined to make up the state's shrinking casino revenue with still more gambling. In response to its declining uh, casino fortunes, Connecticut recently increased the casino's free play allowance so they can beef up their promotions and attract more people to come in and play. And the state legalized the gambling game Kino, which I know you have here in New York State, for convenience stores, bars, and restaurants before being forced to abandon it because of strong public opposition. But that in no way deterred our legislators. <coughs> and now a legislative task force on gambling expansion has launched a campaign to build two or more major slots casinos with 2,500 video slot machines each uh, in order to, and they want to build them in Bridgeport, New Haven, and Windsor Locks at the airport at Bradley Field. Uh, those are the three places they've identified. In order to intercept Connecticut residents tempted and to be so bold <laughs> as to maybe go to Massachusetts or New York in order to gamble. All of these moves pale, however, compared to what some of Connecticut's political leaders appear to have in store for us next. And I guarantee you what your political leaders in New York have in store for you next. Nevada, New Jersey, and Delaware recently legalized in-state online internet gambling for their casinos. And Connecticut's governor has indicated he favors doing the same for ours in order to help them protect their customer base. In other words, having brought physical casinos into the state of Connecticut, the pressure is now building to bolster them with online gambling. It's like the banks, too big to fail. Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun want online gambling in order to attract younger customers, who of course are technologically primed for internet gambling. While addiction experts view it as especially addictive because of the fast pace of the games, their 24-hour availability, and the instant gratification aspect of the action. As one observer put it, legalizing online gambling would be the equivalent of putting a casino in every house, office, and dorm room in the state of Connecticut. And obviously legalizing it for your casinos here in New York would have exactly the same result in New York, except you've got a lot more dorm rooms. <laughs> so what's the takeaway from Connecticut's experience? First, the economic benefits of bringing in a casino are rapidly declining as the Northeast becomes saturated with casinos and they increasingly cannibalize one another. Second, the main argument for bringing a casino into an area has been that it will attract gamblers from outside the area and thereby pump new money into the area's economy. But the growing competition between states and regions is making it increasingly difficult to attract out-of-state gamblers. As a result, most casinos outside of Las Vegas are becoming simply convenience casinos for local people, which means the casinos simply transfer wealth from local residents to the casino owners, creating no new wealth. I mean, think about it for a moment. Maybe you haven't thought about it this way. Where would an Albany area casino draw from other than from the Albany area. <laughs> Not from most of Massachusetts. They're going to build a brand new $800 million MGM <coughs> casino in Springfield, and another $1.6 billion casino in Boston, and another one in Tom, <laughs> and another one, etc. Not from Connecticut. We've already got the two biggest casinos in the Western Hemisphere. Not in the world anymore, but still in the Western Hemisphere. 
and certainly not from the rest of New York State, <laughs> which already has nine racetrack casinos, eight Indian casinos, and of course has authorized seven new full-scale commercial casinos. So where are all these out-of-the-area gamblers going to come from in order to pour all this money into the Albany area? Perhaps from Paris, <laughs> maybe from London, Madrid, Miami, Hong Kong, who knows? After all, I'm sure there have got to be thousands of high rollers across the world who are just dying to come to East Rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> Third, based on Connecticut's experience, you can expect that once the initial success of New York's casinos begins to fade and the casino revenue begins to decline, your state will try to replace it by encouraging still more gambling, whether it be more casinos, more scratch-off tickets, internet gambling, or the latest initiative down in New Jersey, sports betting. In conclusion, let me say that with the social and public health costs of casinos increasing, and the economic arguments used to justify casinos and the costs of, of, of those casinos unraveling, it'd be difficult to choose a worse time to bring a casino into a community and especially into a community like East Greenbush, where so many residents have made it unambiguously clear they want no part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, Kara asked me to answer questions, and I'd be happy to try to answer any questions that you have about anything that I said. Yes, sir. Do you have any comment on when the government subsidized casinos? Uh, the government, I've heard the government, government subsidizing subsidized. casinos? Well, New Jersey has now spent at least a quarter of a billion dollars subsidizing their casinos. I mentioned <coughs> Delaware has now put $41 million in tax breaks and other, uh, uh, other money toward uh, bailing out its three casinos. Uh, when you think of every state that uh, once it brings in casinos, what it has to set up to, to, uh, to monitor uh, uh, those casinos and to regulate those casinos uh, and to uh, the money that is spent uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, rehabilitation and for uh, uh, gambling addiction centers, etc. All the states, in fact, are subsidizing casinos. Is it a no-win situation? Is it a no-win? Is it a no-win situation? Well, in Connecticut, as I say, you know, the conventional wisdom was it was that it was uh, uh, it was uh, uh, financially successful for the state initially, uh, but uh, as uh, as as the situation develops, that almost increasingly the customers are local people. There is no way it can be anything but a no-win situation, because when people talk about well. The casinos are going to come here and they're going to invest so much money in, in, in the Albany area. Where does anybody think that money comes from? It just comes from local people. And then it is transferred from those people to the casino owners, who of course will send it back to Las Vegas or wherever, uh, uh, wherever they happen to be based. You know, one of our greatest economists uh, was Paul Sanderson. And he defined uh, uh, casino gambling in the following way. He said, he said, basically, it is the sterile transfer of wealth from one entity to another without creating any new wealth. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes. Have you, have you ever seen community opposition reverse a casino siding? Uh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Yay! Uh, we, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, it, the, the, the problem that you face, obviously, is the Gambling Commission and the Governor set up these kind of vague, vague uh, rules. Uh, 
by which they will take into consideration support or opposition for a casino. Now, most other states are much more honest than that. <laughs> and they say at least the local community can vote on it. And if you get 51% of the vote, you turn it down. So there have been community after community, for example, we've just gone through this in Massachusetts. Uh, West Springfield, Palmer, Tewksbury, East Boston, Milford. These are all communities that looked as though they were going to get casinos. They put together organizations just like yours, volunteer organizations. In many of these places, for example, Palmer, nobody thought they had a chance. Nobody thought they had a prayer. Mohegan Sun wanted to put a, uh, a $1 billion casino in the little town of Palmer, Massachusetts. And, uh, and they added that they were going to create a, uh, uh, they were going to create a water park. And about half the time they talked about the water park, because usually they don't want to talk about the casino. But they talked about the water park, and they were going to do all these great things for, uh, thank you very much, all these great things for the town of Palmer. About six weeks before the vote, Mohegan Sun uh, polling showed that they were ahead 65 to 35 percent. The casino was ahead. Palmer at that point uh, had uh, almost no organization, anti-casino organization. In the six-week period, they put it together. They raised some money, just a little bit of money. It wasn't a lot of money. They did radio spots. They spent five dollars per spot. That's what the radio, local radio station charged. <laughs> and for the last uh, three weeks, they dominated the radio with these five-dollar advertisements. Uh, and uh, they went door to door. They canvassed every single home. On election night, the anti-casino people won out of 5,200 votes. They won by 92 votes. Oh. Mohegan Sun was so upset, they immediately <coughs> demanded a recount. <laughs> Two weeks later, they announced the recount. The anti-casino people had won by 94. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, you've got another right here in New York. You've got down, I mean, I'm sure you're aware of what's happening in Tuxedo right now. Yep. I mean, Tuxedo has put together a terrific uh, organization to fight, just as you have. I, you know, talking to uh, Elizabeth and, uh, and talking to uh, Kara and uh, doing a little reading about what you've done here and then just looking at, at the audience. I mean, you know, you're, you're, you are right up there, believe me, with with Tuxedo and Palmer and East Boston and some of these great victories that have been scored here in the Northeast. Yay! Yay. <laughs> right. who, who exactly is voting? I mean, we don't really have a say, right? Oh, no. so who is... Uh, well, that's, that's what I... Yeah, how is that's what I, I, I addressed. Uh, I mean, that's the problem. You don't get that opportunity. What the... What the Wherever this commission assembles, supposedly it is trying to study the level of opposition. So your only choice is to do exactly what you're doing and make it absolutely clear that there is enormous opposition in this community. They'll never know just what it is because they've never given you the opportunity to vote. We never had the opportunity to vote either in Connecticut. We never had the opportunity. It was imposed upon us by Congress and by the courts. Uh, but uh, in any event, uh, uh, I have to believe uh, that uh, having said they will take into account the level of opposition, that they have to be looking at that closely. Uh, they have to be looking at all of you here tonight. They have, yeah. they have a breakdown on what they factor in. Right. Mm -hmm. It's 20% public support and 70% <coughs> economic impact. That well, you know, that, that, that sounds great, but how do they, even on the 20%, how do they know what it is? What if it's 100 to 1? What if it's, uh, but, but they, don't, they don't know because there's no way to calculate it except by the outpouring of uh, your, your voices and your presence. Yes, ma'am. Well, rumor has it that the casino promoters have donated lots and lots of money to the governor. Well, look, this, this, is a, this is a huge problem. I mean, look, in Massachusetts, we just had the vote a couple weeks ago on, uh, against all odds, a single individual from East Boston began a campaign to get repeal of the casino law, which was passed in Massachusetts in 2011, 
to get repeal on the ballot. And almost every politician in Massachusetts fought it. The candidates for governor fought it. The then governor fought, fought it, well, he's still the current governor, fought it. The, uh, the attorney general fought it. And yet, by pure persistence, this man and thousands of volunteers went out and got over 116,000 signatures. And they went to the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts. The court reviewed it and said, yes, the politicians cannot keep this off the ballot. It went on the ballot. Uh, we just, the vote just took place in Massachusetts, and unfortunately, repeal lost. But to your point, <laughs> there is a good reason why it lost, and that is money. The casinos, the casino industries uh, ran over 4,300 television ads in the last 30 days of the campaign. The anti-casino group, the pro-repeal group, which had almost no money, ran zero television <laughs> ads. How can you win a campaign, a political campaign in America today without being on television? So that's the problem. You're up against an enormous amount of money. As I said, this is, this is one of the richest and most powerful uh, groups in America. And uh, they exercise some of that power with, uh, with campaign contributions. No question about it. The only thing you've got to put against it is all of you. Did you see the yes, Macy's, did you see the casino advertisements in the Macy's Day Parade? Uh, you know, I have to admit, I did not. I wish I had, but yeah, yeah I mean, that's what it's become. People dancing dice. It's in just the become Day Parade. part and parcel of the fabric of America. Mm -hmm. I don't want to make it part of the fabric of your town. Yes, sir. One of the things that you just grazed on was the fact that uh, New York State and the politicians are constantly coming up with new things to entice. Uh, it was right after New Jersey had started talking about their online gambling that the New York State Racing Association had talked about doing their own online gambling through the Naira. And in New York State, it's 18 years old to gamble all across New York. And most of the time with the lottery, they say with a dollar and a dream, you know, and they're preying on the young people, you know, to, to put it out that way. Well, the, uh, the former uh, uh, president of the American Gaming Association is very famous for having written, actually, in, in one, of his, uh, one of his pieces recently that, uh, that uh, our future as a casino industry lies with young people. Mm -hmm. Casinos know that. They want to get at those young people. Mm -hmm. And as I say, uh, we know that, uh, that uh, online gambling is particularly addictive, attractive, and seductive for younger people who are technologically primed for it. Points well taken. Yes, ma'am. There's already a lot of online gambling. I'm sorry? There already exists a lot of online gambling, which makes, in my opinion, building a physical casino ridiculous because the because their young people will not be attending casinos. Well, you know, that's an interesting idea, except the casino people don't think that's the case for the most part. And that's why the American Gaming Association came out strongly for online gambling until uh, Sheldon Adelson came out and began to uh, contribute large amounts of money to fight it because he believes what you just said. But the casinos in Connecticut uh, believe that it will be an important adjunct to their physical casinos, and that it is a good way to keep keep a tether on their customers when the customers are not at the physical casino. So there is a, there is a lot of controversy about that, but on the whole, the casinos want it. A number of Indian casinos are moving right now toward implementing it. And uh, you're quite right, there are, as I said, there are three states that have it now for their casinos, but it's only in-state that it is legal. Now, a lot of people are gambling offshore, with, with uh, gambling sites offshore. But uh, the fact of the matter is, it's neither legal nor illegal. Uh, the, the United States has gone after the, the uh, <coughs> operators of, of offshore casinos in the past, but has never prosecuted people who would play at offshore casinos. 
There is now a major debate and fight developing in Congress as to whether or not Congress should pass a national law prohibiting internet gambling. In the meantime, states are beginning to move out and do it themselves. And as, as I said, New Jersey, Nevada, and Delaware have been the first to move. But there are at least 10 other states that are actively considering it right now. Yeah, good point. Yes? Can you tell me what uh, states in the United States currently have uh, no gambling casinos, no, a very, either no or a very low gambling casino profile that have a stable economic outlook in their states? Is there any such state like that in the Indian <laughs> <laughs> Or is that just too ridiculous? Well, well <coughs> As close as I, I think that the states that are in the best situation are that are so far are the states that are newest to it, uh, because there hasn't been time for uh, for for all of these uh, uh, counter uh, uh, forces to, to, to sink in. So if you look at the, the two states that are in the worst shape are the two states that started it all, <laughs> New Jersey and Connecticut, right? And I'm leaving Nevada out. That, that's a special case. Uh, but uh, Pennsylvania is now, looks like their gambling revenue is topping out. Uh, Mississippi, uh, uh, other states, Indiana, for example, is such a state. Uh, there are a number of states uh, where that is beginning to happen. And it is happening quicker and quicker and quicker because there are so many casinos. As I said, when Connecticut's built its casinos, there were no other casinos. Of course they were successful. They were between New York City and Boston. They were in the perfect sweet spot. Uh, but today, uh, today, as soon as these casinos are built, they're already facing all kinds of competition. So while in Connecticut, it took us about 14 years for the casino business to start to turn down, now the whole thing is being compressed, and it's just taking a few years. How long will it take in New York? Uh, I don't know, but I don't think it'll be that long. Because you know, you know what's going to happen. You know that New Jersey is going to build casinos in the Meadowlands. They're already talking about it. Right. You know that New York, you know that Gentine wants to build a casino uh, uh, right in New York City. Um, the, the political people just can't resist the money. And it will continue until people like you say no, or it begins to become totally economically unfeasible. Yes? You said that um, you lived right next to the Pequot Reservation. Can you talk about how the town that you were in changed? How well, the towns? How did, how did, what was it like in your town? How did it change physically once the casinos came in? I mean, shops, businesses? Well, remember, we had uh, two very large casinos, bigger casinos than what they're talking about uh, right. here in, in the capital area. Um, but as far as what was it like, uh, well, I watched, uh, I watched, uh, I watched uh, Foxwoods go up story by story by story and a cornfield as it grew out of the woods uh, to become uh, higher and higher and higher. And as I watched it, uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was difficult to believe that a basically rural area where it was built uh, was being turned into this casino city. Uh, Immediately, uh, drunk driving arrests uh, uh, skyrocketed in Norwich, which is the biggest, uh, 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 nearest uh, large town to the casinos. Um, calls to the Ledger Police Department quadrupled. Uh, Norwich, again, uh, uh, the, the biggest town uh, uh, near the casinos. Uh, Norwich uh, uh, had to create what is called an ESOL program, English for Speakers of Other Languages. Because among these 20,000 employees, approximately 5,000 were immigrants who came in and who largely, uh, in many cases, spoke no English. So Norwich had to create this ESOL program, and in the second year, they were, had to educate over 400 kids who spoke collectively over 31 different primary languages, all at the expense of, of the town, of course. But the big thing that we're finding is the studies that are now being done, and the study I just cited you, for example, by, cited to you by this professor from, uh, from uh, uh, Western Connecticut State University. Uh, again, the conventional wisdom has been, well, it hasn't been that much crime. This is the first study that has looked at crime 
around the casinos and the communities surrounding the casinos. And the results are pretty startling. So those are some of the, uh, some of the results. But the casinos were off in a more remote part of the town. Uh, so it wasn't, uh, for example, it was not like building a brand new MGM casino in the middle of Springfield. You know, urban situations have a different set of problems than rural situations. <laughs> Maybe we'll just take one more. Yeah. Uh, Congressman, the troubling uh, story hit the wire today about lobbying that's continuing to go on um, by the casino developers. Ours in particular, James Featherstone Office, quoted as being, quote, particularly active. Um, if the RFAs are done, the requests for applications, if the material has been gathered by the Gaming Commission, what are these people spending additional money on, a lot of money on, and it is the process subject still to politicization. <laughs> you mentioned politicians <laughs> well, the money. Is it are, still up for grabs? There are a lot of people who need to be influenced. <laughs> there are a lot of people who need to be influenced. And it's done in very, very subtle ways. Up in one of the Massachusetts towns, for example, the, uh, when a casino, it was a slots casino, came in and uh, trying to get support from the local people, it would go to the football coach, for example, at the, at the school. And say, you know, you have this very nice football program here. It's really expensive, isn't it, to buy the equipment for your team? You know, we love football. And one of the things we'd like to do is help your team buy some of the expensive equipment it needs. They even went to the music teacher at this high school and said, you know, those oboes and saxophones, they're expensive. We'd like to make a contribution to help you buy musical instruments for your students. And oh, incidentally, would you be sure to talk to the parents of your students about supporting us? Now, they had a vote coming up. Uh, the, money, the money that is spent is, uh, is uh, and then the money is spent to influence you. It's spent, it's spent to, to influence the town councils. It's spent to influence people like you. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's meant to spend, you know, the, the advertisements, the television, the internet, the Macy's uh, uh, Thanksgiving parade. I mean, all that costs money. <coughs> and they've got very, very deep pockets. And the whole goal is to try to persuade you that we as a casino are just another normal mainstream business which would like to come into your town and do business. The governor is going to want opening day to be a parade. He's going to want balloons and flag flying and, and happiness. He's not going to want Sadie Greenbush people waving signs saying, go home. <laughs> No, I, I, uh, I don't know that much about your community, but I do understand that you are one of five board members and the only one who has come out and vigorously opposed this. And I think that's the uh, But I do want to make one last comment. Many people have asked me uh, why I wrote the book as a novel instead of a nonfiction book. And the, the answer to that is, is that we've had three very good nonfiction books about the rise of Foxwoods. They're all 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, but they're good books, and, uh, and I didn't think we need another nonfiction book. My hope was that if I could write an exciting novel set against the factual backdrop of what happened, I could, I could reach a much broader audience. And I could write a story about that puts a human face on what happens when a casino comes to a community. And in doing so, I could reach a much larger audience and I could have a larger impact. And I hope I have succeeded. Thank you very much. Thank you.